Hello everyone. In today's video, I want to tell you a bit about messaging queues and why you want to be familiar with these when designing backend systems. I've been a software engineer professionally for about eight years now, and I've used messaging queues numerous times to build resilient backend systems. A message queue is an extremely useful tool in software engineering that allows you to decouple components in your architecture and ensure resiliency in your processing. Messaging queues are particularly useful when you need to process longer running tasks asynchronously while guaranteeing delivery. For this reason, they're an excellent concept to be familiar with when designing resilient backend systems. In this video, I'm also gonna show you how I set up an SQS polling worker in Go using the AWS SDK. We're gonna have a, a setup that looks something like this diagram. We're gonna have a client which acts as the SQS publisher. In real life, this could be some microservice or some other app that acts as a publisher to your message queue. And we'll have a message queue that contains a backlog of messages that need to be processed. In our example, we're gonna use a SQS polling worker. So we're gonna be explicitly receiving messages through the SDK call and processing those individually. Uh, in real life, you could also use like an AWS Lambda as a consumer, which you wouldn't need to explicitly pull for messages. Another concept we're gonna be going over is this notion of a dead letter queue. When messages cannot be processed successfully after some number of attempts, we can send them to a dead letter queue uh, where you could redrive them uh, at a later point or do some further investigation on those messages. If you're not already familiar with SQS, it's just Amazon's simple queue service. It's just their version of a distributed messaging queue. Um, and we're gonna be working with this today in our example. Okay, let's hop over to the code and I'll show you how I've got the queues set up. Uh, I've got a Terraform file here that's got two queues provisioned. Uh, we've got the dead letter queue, which as I mentioned previously is responsible for receiving failed messages after some certain number of attempts. And then we've got our main queue set up here. Right here, this redrive policy uh, configures the dead letter queue to receive messages after two attempts. So if a message is failed two separate times, it'll go into the dead letter queue. I'll also briefly go over some of these other configuration options. This delay seconds is basically just saying that uh, this is the amount of seconds that must pass before the consumer will be able to receive a published message. You may wanna use something like this if you need to wait some amount of time before you're ready to process a message. So maybe you needed a cache to update or some eventual consistency to happen in your system. There's the max message size. This is pretty self-explanatory. Message retention seconds is how long the message could stay in a queue unprocessed. So if for some reason you didn't have anything consuming the message, it can stay in the queue for this total duration. Receive wait time seconds. This is basically a setting for how long you would do a long poll when invoking receive messages uh, via the SQS client. So if there's no messages available, it can wait up to 10 seconds before returning the call and you could retry that same uh, API call. One other thing to add is I'm gonna be simulating these SQS queues locally using a tool called LocalStack. I've already gone into detail about how to use LocalStack in another video. I'll definitely link that uh, in the description in this video, but I'm not gonna be going into too much detail here. Just know that I'm running a Docker Compose file that has LocalStack and this pretty much allows me to run the uh, SQS queues locally. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through how the SQS worker is set up. I've got some initial code here that uh, basically sets up the SQS client and the AWS config. Um, I'm pulling in some configuration options, the SQS queue name and the local stack endpoint. Once again, uh, you can check out my other video on how local stack works, but this is basically an endpoint that we override that allows us to point to the locally emulated uh, Amazon resources. So this is how we construct our SQS worker. It takes in three arguments. The first one is an SQS worker config. I'll go over these uh, config options in more details. Uh, we also accept the SQS client and we accept a handler. The handler implements an interface that tells us how to process each SQS message. So I'll show you in more details how these things are set up. Over here, we've got this SQS worker package. This is where our SQS uh, worker config is defined. We've got the queue name. This is the actual queue that we'll be pulling messages from. We use the queue name to get the queue URL, which is actually used in subsequent SDK calls. We've also got a concurrency option. 
This allows us to configure the number of concurrent messages that we would allow our worker to process. You could set this to one and process messages serially, or you could set it to 10 and have allowed 10 messages to be processed concurrently. This depends on your workload configuration. If you had super memory intensive or CPU intensive processing, maybe you'd wanna adjust this uh, as needed so that you are not overloading your, your service too much. Likewise, if your processing wasn't that intensive, you could bump this number up and process 100 at a time or something like that. Visibility timeout seconds is an important option. This is the duration that we would want to wait before a message could be received again by a worker for processing. So we would want to set the visibility timeout seconds so that there's sufficient time between a message being received again. Ideally, we successfully process the message and we delete it from the queue. Otherwise, the message fails and we have to wait some duration before it can be retried again. We wouldn't want this to be super low because that means we could have the same message being processed multiple times, um, and we ideally don't want that. Uh, in addition, we have this wait time seconds. This was actually configured in the Terraform as well, but we can override this here. It's basically the duration of a long poll for the receive messages SQS client call. So timeout seconds will be used within the handler implementation, and it's the maximum timeout uh, before the context deadline is exceeded. Here's our handler interface. It accepts a context and the SQS message itself. We can return an error if the processing was unsuccessful or nil if it was successful. As the comment states, if no error is returned, we will go ahead and delete the message from the queue so that the message will not be processed again. And here's our SQS worker struct. It accepts a config, the handler implementation. We have a channel of messages and we have the SQS client. Note that we're using an unbuffered channel here so that we have no size limit. We also have a start method here, implementation that accepts a context. So the first thing that we do is actually retrieve the queue URL using the queue name. And we need the queue URL for all other uh, SDK calls. Here's where we leverage our concurrency option. What we're doing is we're basically just spinning up a Go routine for the level of concurrency that we want. Each of these Go routines is going to be consuming messages from the message channel. Each of these Go routines will then process messages off of the channel. We can see that consume messages is a blocking call. We are continuously iterating this for loop. We're heeding the context in case you know we time out or we're done. And we are continuously listening for messages and processing those individually. So let's go into the process message call. This accepts the go routine ID. We're just using this for logging purposes, the message that needs to be processed, and the queue URL. Queue URL is used uh, for when we need to delete the message after it's successfully processed. At the top of this function here, we've got a defer call to capture any panics. We don't want our entire worker to crash in, in the event that our handler panics. We're creating a new context here, which leverages the timeout in seconds that we provided to the config. Uh, and this will only be used by the handler implementation. If there's an error, we're just gonna log it out and uh, this will get picked up after the visibility timeout seconds has passed again. Now moving back up to the start method, after these go routines are spun up and are listening for messages to consume, we've got a continuous for loop that's actively receiving messages. So it's calling this receive message via the AWS API. Uh, we passed the URL, the visibility timeout in seconds. As we mentioned previously, that's the amount of time we want to wait between receiving a message again. We've also got wait time seconds. And as mentioned previously, this is used for long polling. So if there's no messages available, we'll wait up to this amount of time in seconds before making this API call again. In addition, we're providing this system attribute, which is the approximate receive count. This is just so that in logging, we can know the number of times that a message has been attempted. For example, if it fails, I want to know what attempt we're on. In the receive message output, we've got our slice of messages, and we're just pushing those into the channel so that the Go routines can consume messages from this channel. Okay, one other thing I want to show you is what our handler implementation looks like. So above here, we've got a handler struct that is implementing the handle method, which as we stated previously, accepts a context and an SQS message and returns an error if it's failed. 
Um, we're doing some basic validation above, like if the body's nil, we'll just return an error. Uh, this is the structure that we're expecting our message to look like. It's just a JSON object that contains a duration in seconds. And we're unmarshalling it into this uh, struct here. What we're doing is simulating a long running process using this duration. Uh, we are creating a ticker that is basically iterating continuously for up to this duration in seconds. If we make it to that duration in seconds, it's considered uh, successfully processed. If our context times out before that duration, we'll consider it a failure and it will be retried at some, some later point. So we can simulate a failure by setting a duration longer than our context timeout. And we can, uh, we can demonstrate that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so going back to our worker config, um, let's set a concurrency of one for now. So basically our worker will be processing messages serially. Let's set a visibility timeout in seconds of five minutes. And our wait time in seconds will be 10 seconds. So if we don't receive a message within 10 seconds of the receive message call, we can retry that call again. Our timeout seconds will be 60. So we'll have a minute to process a message before the context will be uh, done. All right, before we get started, I just wanna make sure that my Terraform resources are set up. All right, that took a minute to apply, but I wanna show you that these queues are created locally. So I can use this AWS SQS list queues command and then provide our local stack endpoint override. Okay, so we've got two different queues. We've got our primary queue and then the dead letter queue where our failed messages will go. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is go ahead and start our worker. All right, we've got a log stating that we are running uh, the worker for this particular queue. That's great. Now let's run our SQS publisher. This is a simple app that is just setting up the SQS client. It retrieves the queue using the queue name and it sends a message. We're gonna send a message uh, JSON of 15 seconds. So it should take 15 seconds to process this message. Let's go look at the worker. We can see that it received a message with this ID, with this uh, SQS body, and it says our approximate receive count of one here. So it still says that we're processing this message. Okay, and we can see that the message was processed successfully. And one more thing I wanna do is I wanna add a log statement when we receive a message from a particular Go routine. So now I wanna try publishing multiple messages and building up a bit of a backlog. We're still gonna keep the concurrency at one just to demonstrate that we'll process these serially. Okay, so we're gonna restart the worker because we made that logging change and we wanna pick that up. All right, we've got a log stating that our worker is running and consuming from this queue. Now I'm gonna publish multiple messages from the SQS publisher. Okay, so now we've received a log that we are receiving this message and processing it. We're using go routine zero. All of our logs should indicate that we're receiving messages from go routine zero. Okay, we are processing a new message now. Same go routine. All right, we're processing the third message with go routine zero now. Okay, so we completed processing and all three messages are done by the single Go routine. Let's do the same thing, but let's bump the concurrency up to three so that we can process this much faster. All right, we are running our worker, consuming from this queue. We're gonna publish three messages and we should see that three Go routines uh, are spun up and one Go routine is processing each message.
So we see go routine zero, we've got go routine one, and now we've got go routine two. And these are all processing different messages. So this should take about 15 seconds, which is the duration that we provided for each message. Cool, so we can see that all three of these messages completed processing at roughly the same time. Okay, so now I wanna show you what happens when our message processing duration exceeds our timeout in seconds. We should see that the message fails and it gets retried at a later attempt. So what I'm gonna do is revert this concurrency change back to one since we've already demonstrated that. Our SQS publisher is publishing messages that take 15 seconds to process. So what I wanna do is adjust our timeout to be 14 seconds so that this will uh, cause our context deadline to be exceeded. Okay, so I've modified the visibility timeout seconds to 30 seconds, so this should happen a lot more quickly. Let's rerun the queue. Let's publish our message. We can see that it's picked up, and it should fail after 14 seconds, which is what our timeout is set to. Okay, we can see that it has failed since the context deadline has been exceeded. So now after this visibility timeout has passed, we will see that the go routine uh, picks up the message again and retries it. All right, so it's been received again. And you cannot see it, but the approximate receive count is now at two. So that indicates that we're on our second attempt. And it's failed to publish this uh, message for the second time. Let's check that out and make sure that the message is in our dead letter queue. So first things first, let's list our queues and get the URLs. So now we can see our main queue and our dead letter queue. Now let's list the messages for the dead letter queue. Okay, we can now see that there's a message with this ID in our dead letter queue. Let's verify that that's the same ID we have in here. All right, we can see that that's the same message, so that's pretty cool. So this is some very cool stuff. Uh, you can see how useful a messaging queue can be when you need to ensure that your applications are resilient to the various failures that may occur in a distributed system. In this video, I showed you a trivial example just to demonstrate how an SQS message can be processed using a polling worker. But in a later video, I'll show you a more real world example uh, for asynchronous processing. Uh, I hope you found this content useful and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.